Hey guys, Crypto Mike here with the Mike Check 1212. Is this thing on? How are you doing today? Please hit the thumbs, the subscribe button, and the notification bell if you want to be informed of my live streams and my new videos. Hitting that notification bell, by the way, will help you to be the first to be informed. Now, real quick, if you want to earn some free crypto, two ways. Download the Brave browser, open it up, Sign up for Brave Rewards and you will earn a free basic attention token. The link is in the description. Another way that I've been doing right here, every single day you can mine Pi. Okay, this was created by three Stanford uh, PhD uh, <clears throat> doctors, all right, graduates. And uh, all you have to do is mine and it mines for you every day. All they need is that they need to know that you're there. They need a proof that you're mining, and that's the only way um, that they'll give you pie. All right, so sign up. The link is in the description. It's an easy way to free to earn free crypto. All right, now let's move on. <clears throat> please, please follow me on Twitter. All right. Now you guys are gonna love this one, okay? I'm gonna start out with the juicy stuff. Oh, the whole thing's gonna be juicy. You guys, seriously, this whole thing is gonna be juicy. Um, I'm gonna go into the IMF, um, Jim Rickards, a couple interviews he did, um, a thread, a couple threads on Twitter, one on um, focusing on Kendra Hill, Hill's blogs and how it relates to what Jim Rickards is saying and uh, Christine Lagarde and uh, Mark Carnegie, um, the IMF, the BIS, the Bank of England, the SDRs, um, what's happening with XRP, and what's happening with the whole crisis, okay? And then also there's an article by Cryptopolis on Coil that I want to just skim over. It's very well written, and it, it helps prepare us. It, he's helping us to prepare to um, bounce back from this, this little um, deflationary bubble, okay? that is popping right now. So let's go. Check it out, guys. All right, so uh, let's just check out this video first, okay? Here's a little interview. We're gonna check out a few minutes of this interview first. It's really fascinating, you guys. Check it out, listen. Central banks will actually be the problem. Simple example, uh, before 2008, the um, U.S. Federal Reserve, our central bank in the U.S., their balance sheet was $800 billion. To do the bailout, they took their balance sheet to $4.2 trillion. But they're still there. They've never normalized. They've, they, if they had come back down to $800 billion or even a trillion, I'd say, you know, nice going, guys. You know, you save the day, you normalize your balance sheet, good job. But that hasn't happened. The balance sheet's still up here. Interest rates are still down here. They're not ready for the next crisis. What are they going to do? Take the balance sheet to $8 trillion, $12 trillion? Where's that invisible confidence limit when you destroy confidence in the U.S. dollar? They know they're close to it. So there's only one clean balance sheet left in the world. There's only one source of liquidity in a liquidity crisis. That's the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Now, this isn't well known, but you know, people know that the Federal Reserve can print dollars, the European Central Bank can print euros. Well, the IMF can print their own money also. It has a funny name, it's called the Special Drawing Right, or the SDR. It's world money, that's the easiest way to think about it. The IMF is the central bank of the world, and the Special Drawing Right is world money. And that's where the liquidity will come from, but that will basically mean the end of the dollar is the benchmark global reserve currency we'll be talking about, SDR. So uh, there is this um, complex dynamic going on. Um, and by the way, in a complex system, the worst thing that can happen, the worst crisis, is an exponential function of scale. Now that sounds technical, but I can explain it. What it means is that when you double the system, you don't double the risk. You increase the risk by a factor of 10 or more. And that's what's been happening. Since 2008, the world has created over $70 trillion of new debt. The five largest banks in the United States are larger than they were in 2008. They own a larger percentage of the total banking assets. So everything that was too big to fail in 2008 is bigger and more dangerous today. So when this crisis hits, uh, it's going to be a global liquidity crisis. The central banks will be unable to put out the fire because they're... By the way, this was an interview in 2017. Um, and if you need uh, any... If you need to know who James Rickards is real quick... He is an American lawyer, speaker, gold speculator, media commentator, and author on matters of 
finance and precious metals. Have a recovery from the last one. The IMF will come in. We'll be looking at world money, and that will be a very different world. And Jim, I was intrigued by the subtitle on your book. You're saying that the the international elite has some co- sort of plan to deal with the next crisis. Right. Uh, you know, Bill, when I talk about the the global elite or the global elite's secret plan for the next financial crisis, that's the subtitle. Um, you know, when you say a phrase like global elite, people think you're talking about some deep, dark conspiracy like the Illuminati. I mean, we can, we can say the Illuminati for another day. But these are these are real people. We know who they are. They're, you know, uh, Christine Lagarde, the head of the IMF, someone like Mark Carney, uh, currently the governor of the Bank of England, but formerly the head of the Bank of Canada, also a senior figure at the BIS, so he's got a kind of finger in every pie. Robert Rubin, uh, now head of the Council of Foreign Relations, but former uh, head of Goldman Sachs, former Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, Rubin in the 1990s brought up a lot of younger protégés who today are in very powerful positions. Um, people like uh, Lael Brainerd, who's on the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, formerly at the U.S. Treasury. She was a Rubin protégé. Uh, David Lipton, uh, first Deputy Managing Director with the IMF. So my point is, these are real people. We know who they are. They have real job descriptions. But together, they form a kind of global lead. They meet in places like Davos and the Aspen Institute, the Milken Institute, uh, Jackson Hole. They have their gathering places. Um, interestingly, they all went to pretty much the same schools, one of four or five schools, whether it's MIT, University. Okay, so keep in mind, I'm going to kind of put my my uh, input in here. Okay, We're thinking all this is happening right now. We need to ask ourselves, where does Trump come into this? Okay, This is the, the real questions we, we need to we need to actually ask ourselves. We need to look at the full scope of what's going on. Where does Trump come into this? Now, he, he, he didn't go to Davos. He, he didn't go to Davos in the last few years, but he did last year. Or was it this year? I think it's at the beginning of the year. So he went this year, yeah. Um, but he went very briefly, and he, was, he spoke first. He was there. He spoke on the first day, and then he left because he has a lot, of, a lot of crap going on, okay? He has a lot of things to do. He's very busy. Now, where does he go into? Why does he, when when Trump goes and meets around with people, when he goes to these G20 summits and when he goes all to, to all these meetings, why is he so quick to just to go and then leave? Is it because he's required? He really has to make an appearance just to, you know, just to keep to preserve the image of the president of the United States. Is he really butting heads against all these people, actually, in the background? Does he actually have a completely different idea than they do? That's something I ask myself all the time, okay, guys? We need to ask ourselves these questions because we we need to not fool ourselves. Now, basically, President Trump just took a lot of power back for the, the Treasury from the Federal Reserve. What does that mean? Where does the U.S. Treasury... What, what place and what position does the U.S. Treasury take in all of this, this global currency reset, this one world currency? Um, now, listen to a little more of this interview, just a minute. Chicago. So it's not really a conspiracy. It's more a close-knit group of like-minded individuals. And together, they have a certain view of the world. They run the international monetary system. My point is that they see... What- now, is Trump maybe controlled opposition? Is that what that is? That's something that goes through in my mind all the time. We're talking about... That's something that... The global elite, you guys, they know that people are on to them, okay? They know people are on to them. They know people are on to their whole scheme, their wicked plans, right? So if they could develop a plan... To have someone rise into power that everyone starts to love. Now, it would be easy. It would be easy through reverse psychology to get all the media to bash on this person. So much so that he he kind of becomes the underdog that the media hates. And so many people hate him that people start to feel bad for him because it's it's irrational. All the hate, all the un, just the biased hatred towards him and not even talking about any of the good things he does 
it, it's really it's a psycho it's a psychological um play okay they're playing with us um now who's to say that that's not part of the plans to get us starting to root for him because he actually is opposing the elite or so they say or so we think all right so what he has he has all these plans and he actually starts to succeed okay the first the first half of his presidency is a lot of turmoil but he still wins he still wins somehow with everyone, all the elite, all the news media hating him, hating him, wanting him to go down. But he still managed to win in every scenario. Just this one guy with all these unseen patriots in the background, right? And this QAnon guy, right? This is just a, these are just thoughts, okay? I'm not saying this is true. These are just real thoughts, okay? Um... And then, so we start to love him, we start to praise him, we start to think, yes, we finally have a good guy who's facing the elites and standing up for us, you know, for our human rights, for the original constitution. And then they wrap it up in this pretty Nasara package that we start to really love because it seems to actually be for our goodwill, for the, for, for the, you know, for the, for the, the good of humanity, okay? However, it's the same exact thing as this one world currency, as this one world order. It's just wrapped up in a, a package that is more appealing to us. What do you think? Let me know what you think. This is just thoughts that I'm just kind of coming out with, okay? Um, so anyways, that's something that Jim Rickard says. Now, listen to... Um, there's a couple other things. Now, right here, this is a great thread put out by Status. Okay, he's the one who does the XRP community uh, poster. Okay, watch this thread to share. Elite's goal is IMF, the IMF, World Bank, central banks are the elite. One world order, one world taxation, one world money. James Rickards, econ economist, finance expert. This is a one minute clip of him in another interview. 189 individuals. As I began connecting the dots, a pattern emerged. It revealed a network of more than 189 individuals positioned inside the world's major financial institutions. Some of them hold senior positions inside the IMF, World Bank, and every central bank in the G20, including our own Federal Reserve. These elites share one vision and they're about to make it a reality. That vision is one world order, one world taxation, and one world money. They've worked for years behind the scenes preparing to realize that vision. They've literally rigged the laws of international finance. Everything is basically in place right now, and there's essentially no way to stop this from happening. When the crisis hits, they'll flip the switch, freezing the global financial system. That will give them time to reset the world economy according to their vision. As the coming crisis unfolds, President Trump will be powerless to stop it. In fact, trying to stop them would probably weaken the president's power altogether. Okay. <clears throat> Trump declared a national emergency, right? Um, they're saying, okay, he's saying that there's nothing that could stop this, okay? But even if Trump tries, he can't. Now, what if he does, though? What if he stops it? What if he does stop it? It looks like he's... He's trying and he's succeeding like usual. He wins. He wins no matter what, right? Nothing brings him down. It's crazy. But it's almost like he was destined to win, like he knew he was going to win from the get-go because it was planned out. That's what it seems like to me. I'm not trying to make anyone bash their head against the wall or anything. Um, I just have these thoughts that I need to get out, process, and and put out in, into the open and I hope you guys will leave in the comment section what you think because to me it kind of you know this kind of makes sense a little bit because I've been racking you guys know me I've been racking my mind over this stuff um let's listen to the next video it's a one minute clip the network of the global elite is, is the IMF the Fed central banks Bilderberg group Wall Street intelligence agencies and the media all right 
Like I said, John, more than 189 elite agents have slowly wormed their way into leadership positions across the board. They now sit at or near the head of the IMF, the World Bank, and even our own Federal Reserve. They also control much of what happens at the central banks of China, Russia, India, Brazil, Canada, and Europe. As you know, these institutions form a kind of global superstructure. It forms a kind of snare net encircling all nations. Their leaders aren't democratically elected. They're not accountable to you and me. They're beyond the reach of government and citizens, and yet they hold the fate of the global financial system in their hands. To get a sense of how they operate, imagine an array of floating spheres. One sphere is labeled IMF. One is labeled Fed. One is labeled Bilderberg. One is labeled Wall Street. One is labeled central banks. One is labeled intelligence agencies. One is labeled media, and so on. The elites inhabit all of these spheres, and together the network forms a kind of 3D Venn diagram. As I see it, regardless of what sphere they inhabit, the elites all share the same vision. One world order, one world taxation, and one world money. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you know, that that's a big thing that they've been doing. Um, they've been doing it over decades and even centuries. It's been just kind of slowly been coming together. They've had these plans for a long, long time. And it's finally come into a head because they've been putting the little pieces together little by little, little by little. And now it's finally coming true. Okay. Ice nine. Okay. Some of the elite individuals include out of the 180, Christine Lagarde, Mark Carney, Raghuram Rahan, Haru Hiku. I don't know who that is. Um, the rest I've never heard of. Okay. But... Here's another. Are you able to share the identities of these elites with our viewers? We've identified more than 189 individuals who are in many cases hiding in plain sight. Regardless, they all share the same vision. One world order, one world taxation, and one world money. A short list would include Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, IMF. Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England. Raghuram G. Rajan, Vice Chairman of the Bank for International Settlements. Haruhiko Kuroda, Governor of the Bank of Japan. William C. Dudley, President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Augustine Carstens, Governor of the Bank of Mexico. Janet Yellen, Chairman of the Board of the Federal Reserve System. Mario Draghi, President of the European Central Bank. Zhu Min, former Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. Zhou Xiu Kuan, Governor of the People's Bank of China. Robert E. Rubin, Chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. This A-list of central bankers and other elites is just the tip of the iceberg. Of course, not one of these elites will tell you outright what's going on, but I've seen and heard enough to connect the dots for myself. Yeah, exactly. Now, so, elites plan classify BlackRock as too big to fail. Freeze sci-fi. Sci-fi. Um, I don't know what that means. Sci-fi. Okay. Freeze BlackRock clients' accounts, take control of accounts remotely. BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager with $7.4 trillion in assets under management. That's the last video. I'll show it to you. And then I'll go on um, and I'll show you Kendra Hill's uh, version of what's going to happen. And it actually ties in very nicely with what, what this is. Okay. And then I'll go on and I'll actually show you a little bit of what I think is going to happen will take control of BlackRock's assets remotely. But what did these elites want from your contact at BlackRock? Basically, they want to classify BlackRock as too big to fail. The technical term is Systemically Important Financial Institution, or SIFI. That designation normally applies to banks, such as Bank of America. If your bank gets the SIFI label, it means the government will bail you out first in a crisis. But it also means you must turn over control of your bank until the crisis subsides. In this case, they're trying to reclassify BlackRock, an asset manager, as too big to fail. If they succeed, they'll be able to freeze BlackRock when the crisis hits. BlackRock clients won't be able to sell. They won't be able to buy either. Their accounts will go dark indefinitely. And the elite operatives will take control of BlackRock's assets remotely via the Internet. But our research shows that their ICE-9 plan goes much, much deeper than that. But what did these elites want? Right. So, um... So this is basically freezing and resetting the world's economy, the world financial system, okay? So that was a great thread by Status. Um, go check him out on Twitter. Now, there's another thread here, and it's about Kendra Hills. By, by the way, I just, you know, seriously follow me on Twitter. I just retweeted a, good, a bunch of good tweets. 
um, by I Am Legion and uh, Crypto Addy. And uh, this is an, another one that I, I've made videos on this, okay? Um, go check the videos out. I'll leave the links in the description, but this video, all right, I, I made this video right here, Whistleblower, I made this four months ago, and then Conspiracy Piecing Together the Pieces. These are two videos I made on Kendra Hill, all right? And um, and her views and her views are very fascinating to go over. And so we'll go over these views right here. Oh, let me plug. OK, we'll go over these views right here in this thread. I'd like to introduce the XRP community to on crypto Twitter to Kendra Hill, an XRP insider. It's not her real name. OK, so she did a blog. Um, she was on Steam it for a while in 2018 and she did a, a series of blogs and She's basically saying that XRP is meant for much more and it's not even meant to be a one world currency, but it's meant for something bigger than that. It's meant to control the derivatives markets, which means the price of it is going to blow up like none, nothing you've ever seen in your life. All right. Now, what she's saying is that the one world currency is actually going to be stellar, stellar lumens. So the thing is, what you would want to do is hold both of them. Okay. Cause we don't know exactly what the timing is and I'm not sure if this is true or not, but it seems to be true. Okay. Another thing is this might all be just something that we're following pretty deeply. Okay. This might be just blowing smoke. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe this is a psyop, you know, there's another theory that I have as well, which is why I hold all three, <laughs> three, three, XRP, because I do think it will succeed. Stellar Lumens, because I do think it will succeed. And Hedera Hashgraph, because it's something completely new. And Google is on the governing council. Boeing, but also IBM. Okay, IBM, Google and IBM. Okay, Google and IBM both are at the center of quantum computing and the advancement of it, okay? Therefore, yes, they obviously probably have something to do with, um, you know, Hedera has something to do with the quantum financial system, right? I would definitely have, I would hold all three of them. And um, if this big freeze happens and this reset, probably all three of them are going to succeed, all right? So let me know what you think about that. Um, if you want to check this out, okay, go, go watch the two videos. I'll leave the links for both of them in the description. All right. But, um, I did a video on, on this thread and then I also went over her, um, her blog myself on, uh, steam it. Okay. But it's pretty fascinating guys. And she also details a grim future. All right. For, you know, kind of what we're seeing, you know, Agenda 2030, she she basically tells us, she told us what's up, and um, we're starting to see all it come to come to play. You know, it's really kind of sad. But IOTA is another one to check out, guys. Okay, IOTA. Um, anyways, so yeah, check this out. This is XRP Riddler Archive. I did a video on another thread of his a few days ago. Um, so. One more thing real quick. I do want to just go over a little article that, um, by the way, another thing about Hedera real quick. Okay. The crypto rating council, which Brian Brooks from Coinbase, who now is the second most powerful person in the U S banking sector, um, because he was pulled over by Steve Mnuchin onto, uh, the, into the office of the comptroller. Um, Brian Brooks, he was the chief legal officer on Coinbase. He's the one who created the USDC, the US dollar, um, the US dollar coin, basically the, the Coinbase's stable coin. Okay. He created the crypto rating council as well. And this is what the SEC is going by actually. Okay. This rating, um, this rating, uh, council, this, this, this rating ledger or with a way, not ledger, but the way to rate these cryptocurrencies as far as are they securities or not? Um, and if they're on here, 
then they're most likely not a security and they're highly looked at. Now, Hedera Hashgraph is on here. That tells me that it's most likely going to be listed on Coinbase. Now it's already on Coinbase Pro, but I would, I would, um, assume that Hedera is going to be on Coinbase, regular Coinbase. And you guys, whatever's on regular Coinbase is going to succeed during this next bull market. Okay, so XRP is going to succeed. Stellar Lumens is going to succeed. And I would have to assume that Hedera Hashgraph will succeed, especially because this Hashgraph is super duper fast. It's secure. Okay. Um, and uh, let's go check out that article real quick. The inflation. Okay, this is Cryptopolis. He's he's awesome. Okay, he goes on Brad Kynes' channel once in a while. And... Um, I really enjoy when I watch, when I'm able to see him on there. He's, he's got a good head. Now, I'm just going to kind of go over this um, for a minute. The reasoning, okay, lower interest rates he's talking about. We were expecting lower interest rates. I went over that in my last video yesterday, okay? Now, negative interest rates, yeah, um, we're going to see those probably. One of the events that indicated this might happen was a sudden increase to 10% in the overnight repo market in September of 2019. It would take too long to explain what the repo market is and how it works, but I encourage you to review the shows I did last October, November, and December. But okay, this scenario is not meant to scare anyone. I could totally be wrong about that, what might happen, but the evidence for what's coming is mounting and much of it is already come to pass, including the prediction I made of zero and negative short-term interest rates. There are proactive things you can do to prepare, some of which are listed below if you understand what's happening. The worst thing you can do is ignore what's happening or be paralyzed due to fear. There are really positive things that you can do to help position yourself now to survive and thrive in the recovery. Yes, a recovery will come if even for a brief time. So what is the deflationary recession? In a deflationary recession, almost every asset class declines in price and the economy typically suffers. Unemployment rises, companies profit shrinks, and there's a decrease in GDP. It also affects wages, which will also decline. But since the price of everything goes down, you may not immediately feel its effects. What happens in a deflationary economy? Hoarding of cash becomes a priority not spending because people are uncertain of the future. That doesn't spur the type of spending the Fed needs to meet their inflation targets, so they will add additional stimulus like sending checks to citizens, helicopter money, tax cuts, interest on holidays, on students' loans, and etc. Cash, cash equivalents, T-bills, etc. are the only safe havens in a deflationary recession. People will be reluctant to borrow even at zero rates because they don't feel confident about paying it back in the future with unemployment rising. Consumer confidence drives our economy. When consumer confidence suffers, so does the economy. However, what comes after this period of deflation and lack of consumer confidence may be much worse if you're not prepared. Once the deflation is over, we will likely enter a period of inflation once again as people start to feel more confident about the future. Something will give them hope. It would be a vaccine for the virus, the end of a political or military conflict, or other event. People will borrow again, buy things they put off, and look forward to the future. But the extreme measures the government and central banks took to reverse the deflationary trend will have a kind of rubber band effect. Monetary policy stretch the rubber band to near breaking point. Once inflation begins, it will snap back fast and make up for the year or more we were in deflation by hyperinflating nearly all asset prices. There you go, hyperinflating. Hyperinflation is a rapid increase in prices, especially in commodities. This will be the outcome of excessive stimulus and money printing that took place by central banks around the world during the previous period by, of depla deflation. The delayed inflationary snapback will catch many off guard. At first, everyone will think we are in a recovery, and that is true. But the hyperstimulus snapback will start to accelerate and central banks will raise interest rates to cool things down. They will tell everyone they, they will get it under control by raising rates, but it will be too late. Hyperinflation will be like a runaway train, unstoppable. 
After a brief recovery of stock prices as we come out of the deflationary period, raising interest rates to tame inflation will send the stock market lower because the risk-free rate of return will be too good to pass up and people will keep the money they save during the deflation period in risk-free cash and cash equivalents. The bond market will also decline rapidly as interest rates rise.